Mary asked me to do this and she called it history taking, but I kind of thought that was like teaching your granny to suck eggs because you're all optometrists and you've all been doing it for years. So I'll fly through that bit because lunch is calling. Um, and I'll just kind of maybe mention wee bits that I, I would possibly concentrate on that are more IP related. Um, commonly used subject headings, which I'm sure you all know, and we'll just kind of fly through them. What does the patient complain of? That's the reason for being in the chair. Uh, most of the time, sometimes it's just for a routine eye examination and they're complaining of nothing. But if they've come in with a specific sore eye, I always put in quotation marks what it is they're actually complaining of. Um, curtain coming over their eye, can't look at light, just can't read any more hen, or things are all blurred. That kind of thing. And there's a couple of reasons for doing that, though, because, I mean, I'm sure you've all been in the same situation. A patient comes in and they tell you they can't read a newspaper anymore, can't put their line on the bookies, as it may well be in my case. Um, and so you refer them because their cataract's there and it's bad and nucleosclerosis get worse. They go to the hospital and they come back and the hospital tell you the patient has no complaint, they're quite happy with her. But And you're like, because <laughs> you've documented it. But at least you've documented things to come back. So if you always document just a wee bit of what the per person says and then you can tie up loose ends at the end. It helps maybe make a diagnosis a wee bit clearer. <coughs> Is the complaint unilateral or bilateral? And that's, that's a huge one, really. Um, because if it's uveitis and it's bilateral or something granulomatous going on general health-wise and that's not ringing a good bell. Um, and so always try and find that one out. What are the durations of the symptoms? And do the symptoms tie in with any changes to general health lately? Have they had an upper respiratory tract infection? Is the vision affected? That kind of thing are, are all things you have to investigate. Things that I'm sure you've already been told um, as you've gone on the course, as things have gone on. And are those symptoms linked to any new medications? Are the durations of the symptoms linked to the duration of that type of medication? That kind of a thing. Um, just try and, and see if there's anything there. And if, have they had any recent travel abroad? And are they contact lens wearers? All sorts of things. Past ocular history I find important because sometimes they have an amblyopic eye and the vision ain't going to get any better anyway, but if you're going to refer on, it's useful to the person who's being referred to that they know that that eye can't achieve any better vision from what your records tell them. Um, and has there been any previous ocular surgery and has that been recent? And are there any post-operative complications that you should be looking for? Um, could be sutures, could be uveitis, just all that kind of a thing. In general health, and I've specifically about conditions relating to ocular conditions. And you get, in my practice anyway, you get very au fait with all the general drugs that are out there for cardiac disease, diabetes, hypertension, allergy, all of these things. You become quite good at identifying what they are. And I've put their medications, I've left that there because it's really quite broad. What I do when I'm recording their medications is I, I literally make a list on the record of what it is. If they have that list with them, I'll take it. If they don't have it, I'll take what they have in their memory, which is usually a wee white one hen, and then there's that red one. And you're like, so if they have that list of medications, I'll write it down. But what I'm doing when I'm writing it down is I'm grouping them. I'm grouping them into families, I'm grouping them into that's a blood pressure medication, that's a statin, that's a PPI, and I'm doing that, I'm not necessarily looking at the dosage, I'm just generally taking down what group of medication they're in, knowing what they're for, so that I can work out with the rest of the, the examination what I'm going to do with that knowledge, and I, do they have any allergies, because if I have to prescribe something for them, I really kind of want to know if they've got any allergies to any antibiotics, that kind of thing. So make sure you're covering yourself medical legally by taking as good a history and symptoms as you possibly can. A social history, do the drive, which is really important for me in the glaucoma clinic. Um, do they smoke? If they've got cardiovascular disease, I must be the biggest snag in the world. Um, do they live alone? Will they be able to manage the drops that I'm giving them? Do they have the mental capacity to, to know that they need these drops or do I have to engage with other healthcare workers and social workers um, and practice nurses to have these things taken care of for the patient? Are they at risk of falls if they're on their own? That's a big one for all sorts of things. 
visual field defects, macular cataract, that kind of thing. So kind of go through their social history as well. Do they drive for a living? Because that's another one with my glaucoma clinic that can be really hard for the patient. And as you know, as we're all getting older, that driving standard, um, if they're not meeting that, that could be their one source of getting out. That can be their one source. I have a lot of patients who are carers, and if they can't get out to drive with, with whoever they're caring for, that's a huge part of their life upset. So you kind of have to ask all of that. The examination, just look at the patient, as well as listening to the patient, take in what you're looking at. Now, is there anything obvious? Do they have eczema? Do they have rosacea? Can you see that hordeolum waving at you? You know, all obvious things like that. But also look to see, how are they frail? Have they got a good pallor? Are they pasty? Are they sweaty? And sometimes in my practice, that's, there's a lot of drug abuse, so I'm watching their pallor to see what kind of a history I can rely on. How, how obese are they? If they're a diabetic patient, is that control good? So take in the appearance as well as obvious eye things that you're looking for and consider the behaviour of the patient. Is there anything glaringly wrong, which I'll just show you in a wee minute in one of my case records. Is the patient ag agitated? Are they spaced? Are they coherent? And is that patient of a mental capacity to understand what you're doing or should they have somebody there with them as a duty of care to the patient? So take all of that in in your examination. And let me just go through histories then. And please remember that I'm, I'm immortal. I didn't take case histories where it was a steroid response. I didn't take case histories where there was something obviously ocular. Um, but just a wee few that I could tie in some systemic stuff for you. So... This is a typical patient in my practice, and they've got heart problems. So there's how I group my meds. I've got an ACE inhibitor, a calcium channel blocker, I've got a nitrate, I've got an anticoagulant, I've got a statin, and another nitrate, all to treat what you already know is a heart problem. So that would just be routine in the practice, blah, 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 blah. blah. <coughs> VA is not bad, IOPs are fine, visual fields were normal. I'll show you why I'm taking that in a wee second. I did a 24-2. And CCT is normal. He has externally a huge lesion there. And it was such a huge lesion that it was causing an ectropion as well. Um, and he did actually complain of watery eyes. He, uh, we didn't ha he did have a complaint and it was of a watery eye. So that huge lesion, I mean, I ha I, it was such a weight on the lid that it was causing that ectropion. So... After the eye examination, we, I did a frontal exam, and there is a wee hemorrhage there. And if you go on the sign guidelines, disc hemorrhages, possible precursor to glaucomatous disc damage, possible hypertension, and possible caused by this medication, because he's on warfarin, he's on an anticoagulant. The differential diagnosis of the lesion, I put a few up there, but if I go back to the lesion, have I got it there? It has a rolled edge, and it's ulcerated down here, so it's, it's got a wee ulceration there, and as a basal cell carcinoma expands, the blood supply in the centre goes and it starts to ulcerate. So to me it looked kind of BCC-ish. So I have two things, I have a disc hemorrhage and I have a skin lesion. I have a glaucoma head on, so I do his 24-2 and his CCT. 24-2 is fine, he's no family history, but the, the nerve head looked healthy. So me, I'm not referring to that splinter hemorrhage. I'm thinking that's from his anticoagulant. And I think that's safe to watch in any practice, not just my practice. I think it, all of us could, if you were worried about glaucoma, could repeat those glaucoma tests before even thinking of referral for that one. So I wasn't too bothered about that, bearing in mind that he's on the anticoagulants. And it's quite a common one on the anticoagulants. So if you have a patient with a splinter hemorrhage at the disc, just going to check that they're not on any medications that might actually cause that as well before you send it to the glaucoma clinic, but I'll just send it back to you. This, on the other hand, I asked the man, did he have a previous history? I had to go back to the history because I hadn't, I hadn't taken that in his initial history. So you go back and you don't be afraid to go back and you say, you ever had any of these removed before? And he, he then said, yes, he had. Um, and I said, well, again, I guess we're going to have to go back there and think about removing that one because it is causing the ectropion in the water. It is annoying you. I went, oh, no, I'm not doing that again. And he had had the first one excised by uh, plastic surgery. 
and they had taken him off his warfarin for the surgery and he'd suffered a clot in the arm and he said the clot in the arm was worse than anything else they'd had and he was quite happy with the skin lesion, thank you very kind, just leave me alone. And I said, well, what if we spend you to oculoplastics, but we mentioned to oculoplastics the problems that you've had and you have to be aware that as well as the as well as the actions of the medication, you have to be aware of the withdrawal of a medication. So if you withdraw somebody from an anticoag, then obviously they've got a huge risk of clotting. So he said, yeah, okay, I'll consider that. I've sent them to a very nice oculoplastics team in Glasgow. I'm sure you'll come across them, they're lovely. And it was such a huge lesion that they were excising it in two stages. So they cut the lesion in one day, they send it away for biopsy. And if the guys in the lab are happy that none of the edges are, are containing anything nasty, then they can um, do reconstruction the next day. So they, that's what they've done. And he was only off the warfarin for two days, whereas previously it had to be off it for six days. And the two days were fine and we had no risk of, we had no clot. But what to remember there is take into account the holistic needs of the patient, be aware of the systemic complications as well as the withdrawal of those complications. And if you all work together as a team, oculoplastics, GP and you, then you can manage these quite easily without the patient being terrified or without having the same problem as he'd had previously. So, again, this lady I didn't refract, she had come in and her problem when she came in was she was having problems sleeping and she was terribly photophobic. Right? Really, really <coughs> terrible problems sleeping and really terrible problems with photophobia and it was worse than she was in a darkened room. So in her bedroom at night when she was trying to sleep, she was bothered by all these lights, right? So I think, okay, so general health's fine, she had trouble sleeping and her medications were an SSRI and levothyroxine, right? So nothing, no, not any huge medications. Non-driver, <coughs> non-smoker. So I'm thinking, oh, flashing light, flashing lights, bilateral, oh, bilateral PVD, it's not really likely, however. And I'm thinking bilateral uveitis. Mm. So I thought, and she'd gone on about her sensitive eyes and a, a, a temporal headache, just a dull ache. And I'm thinking chronic angle, because I'm always thinking things like that. So I went through an eye examination with her and everything apart from a slightly dry eye checked out fine. She had, I, I did gonio, did everything. Um, everything was absolutely fine. So as I've said, go back and ask again, something wasn't ringing true. So the patient was sitting comfortably throughout this. So she was in my test room with bright strip lights telling me about her photophobia. And she'd sat through a slit lamp examination without giving me the... And I thought, ah, something not right. So I'm thinking, that's why you just dig a wee bit deeper and don't be afraid to go back and dig a wee bit deeper. I haven't put the full case record up on this one because I said, I was thinking neurological, I was thinking, oh. so I, I said to her, are there any other, you know, apart from the mild dry eye, I can't find anything, do you have any other symptoms, any numbness, any tingling, I'm thinking, you know, anything at all, <laughs> she said, could the symptoms be from light exposure, and I went, eee! and I'm like, well, what kind of light exposure are you thinking, and you may laugh, and I haven't put it down here, because it wasn't funny, <laughs> however, she believes that our neighbour is involved with gang warfare and that he's got it in for her and he's exposed her to some light. And the whole time she's telling me this, her face is straight, my face is straight. And, she's think, and she thinks that he's the cause of her light sensitivity because she can't possibly look at light in her kitchen, even though her, her blinds are drawn, he's out there with this big light. And I'm thinking, ah, uh ah. -uh. So I say, okay, right, I say, well, <coughs> I think you've got a slightly dry eye. That makes you a wee bit sensitive to light. I'm going to treat your dry eye and see you back tomorrow to see if these drops are doing anything because I was buying myself time, I a clue. So I'm thinking, go back to your medications, Maggie. She's on ceterolene, right? And its licensed use is depression, OCD, panic disorders, or social anxiety. And I'm thinking, ah, ah. Right, here we go. So, side effects for that. Hypersensitivity reactions that could well be photophobia, for all I know, photosensitivity, visual disturbance, nervousness, and angle closure. Well, I've checked for the angle closure, but everything else fits, right? But check out the withdrawal for that as well. So I've got sleep disturbance. She's not sleeping at night. 
she's got a headache, she's anxious, she's got visual disturbance. I think that. <laughs> so it's one of them. So I go back to her and I have to say to her, are you taking your medications that the GP's given you? And the answer, surprise, surprise, was no. But I don't know how long she had been off them. So that, to me, is an ocular visual problem for, for the patient. And she's very anxious and she's convinced she needs to see an eye specialist, which, by the way, is not me. She's not impressed with me at all. Right, so I have to say to her, well, I'll tell you what, let's phone the GP and see what he says. So I phoned the GP and the GP and she said, oh, that's we. Now, they know them. And where our system falls down is we're not joined up. If we had access to all of that, we would know. So GP knows this patient, so she's off her meds again. And I'm like, ah. And it, <laughs> so he arranges a psychiatric assessment. And I have, I have to then say to her, spoke to the GP, he'd like, he'd like you to, to visit him. And she'll go, he, he sent me here. I'm here with my eyes and he sent me here. You're sending me back to him. And then you have to approach the subject and you have to be that healthcare professional and just remember the holistic needs of the patient. And just remember, it's not just ocular side effects that you're out there going to be exposed to. You have to take in all the systemic stuff as well. Systemic stuff you wouldn't normally have thought to have to do. So the outcome of that was she was um, sent to psychiatry and reassessed again. This one, this guy I've known for years, diabetic, tends DRS, right eye amblyopic. Now that's significant in this one. And again, medications, we've got allopurinol for gout, we've got statin, metformin for glaucoma, trazodone, lisinopril, ACE inhibitor, glycoside, omeprazole PPI, and IM supplement. So that one will be a wee relaxant, won't it? We try as a one, because he is quite anxious. And he, he is anxious because he cares for his wife. He has a full-time job and he cares for his wife and he's a bus driver. So we see him, he's slightly hypermetropic, nothing really there. And I did a dilated OE as you would. There are some exudates around the maculus that's kind of blocked off by the green screen, sorry. But there were some exudates there and some blot hemorrhages pretty close to the macula. The macula looked quite messy. And an OCT showed some thickening of the macular area. And I can see that there, just a wee bit of edema. So he's got a wee bit of edema. So yeah, again, this is a guy I know and I know to be anxious. And I know that he's, he's usually quite good at taking care of himself. So you go back and you say to them, yeah, well, there's some diabetic changes there. I'm going to refer you on for those diabetic changes. But what's going on here? I mean, because it's usually quite good. So he checks his own blood sugars. And his, own, his blood sugars at the moment are 17.6, or at that time were 17.6, which he knows are high. But because he's a carer, he's not been able to get to his usual appointments. And so the care of himself has gone down the swanee. And so you have to bear that in mind that these patients are human, they've got other things going on in their life. And although you'd like to say to them, oh, that's dreadful, you have to have your diabetic here in good control. Life's not always like that for some of them. And so you have to give a wee bit more of sympathy. And it raises the question of, well, I have a lot of patients who monitor their own blood sugars. And then I have a lot of diabetic patients who are only monitored once every six months by their diabetic nurse. And those that monitor can come in and say to me, well, my blood sugars were, 11 today, that's good for me. But you as healthcare workers know that that control should be tighter and it shouldn't be sitting at 11. But for that patient, that patient can tell you that that's good for them. And so you have to kind of take in the holistic needs of the patient and say, why is that good for them? And diabetes being a complicated uh, problem, you've got to take in account of their blood pressure control, their dietary control, their exercise control. All of that goes on in their life. And some patients are particularly good and particularly good with tight, tight control and they watch their diet, go to bed. But because it's a, an insulin resistance thing, they get up the next morning and their blood pressures are sky high. So this wee guy had let his hair go and you send him not only to the DRS, you send him to his practice nurse because that really needs to be addressed fairly soon. So there's two, two referral systems there. One, one to ophthalmology to, to cope with the macular edema and two to his practice nurse for a wee bit more, a wee bit more guidance. So he got three ILEA injections and macular smashing afterwards, smashing thickness. 
um, back to normal, just looking smashing. So that was his amblyopic eye, he's a bus driver, so fortunately it was his amblyopic eye. Had that been his good eye, he, it, then he would have had problems with his livelihood as well. So know all of that in your history, tie it all up at the end, make sure your patient's taken care of fully. Um, practice nurse checks and his medication was changed to uh, a long acting insulin, just that was the best way to manage him. Case four. <coughs> Referred by own optometrist to the glaucoma clinic with a raised IOP. And again, medications were aspirin, salbutamol, teotropium, atorvastatin and omeprazole. All groups I would know. And the teotropium, salbutamol, all for COPD. Teotropium is an anti-muscarinic. So it's quite common. One, especially if they're inhaled teotropiums, that they get shallow anterior chambers. So he comes in and I've taken that, and as I'm taking that, I'm thinking, that's in my head. My head's thinking it's not a narrow angle. Um, so it was. His pressures were 30 and 27. CCTs were good. Gonio was narrow, which I wasn't surprised at, because he's also slightly hypermetropic, and he's also got by bilateral nuclear sclerosis. So you've got the bilateral nuclear sclerosis with the lens kind of swelling and then it's moved forward by the anti-muscarinic effect of teotropium. And there's a wee bit of excavation down here and a wee bit of excavation on the lower rims down here, but it's not a very good photograph because there is that wee bit of early cataract there. And the OCT kind of confirms that wee bit inferior temporal thinning in that right eye. The best way to treat that is cataract extraction because that's going to take away that lens deep in that anterior chamber. So he initially was started on a prostaglandin while he was waiting on cataract surgery just to protect the optic nerve head um, <coughs> and then he was listed for surgery and after surgery we stopped the prostaglandin because the anterior chamber was fine and the IOP had fallen to 14 millimetres and he's monitored once a year but possibly could be discharged into community now. So Although you have a systemic drug effect on the eye, it's treated not as you would always think of with, with continuous drops, but actually to tackle the problem and remove the lens and deepen that anterior chamber. So in summary, I want you to know all the medications, group them in your head, look up those that are new to you. If you know the group, if you know the group of the medication, you kind of know the side effects of, of that group and the contraindications of that group. And that becomes second knowledge after time. You just kind of know these things. Have an idea of the, the way the drug works. So if it is an anti-muscarinic, you know that that's what, what to look out for is shallow of the anterior chamber. If it's an ocular side effects, that's about the only time I think I ask if there's a dose-related thing. So if it's something like hydrochloroquine and it's dose-related <coughs> to an ocular side effect, I'll maybe ask them what dose they're on, that kind of thing. But generally, I'm just kind of grouping things together. If things don't add up, readdress the history and symptoms with regards to compliance. Remember the withdrawal side effects as well as the actual action of the drop. Um, and I've put a wee, just a wee reference in there on the history taking. I really don't want to spend too much time on that because you have all been doing it for years. But if there's any particular questions, then again, I'll take them. I didn't do, I didn't do things like High IOP is a steroid effect, just other things that you have to think about in this lecture. <laughs>